myself about that. Okay, there we go. All right, so now we're recording also and we're on live. So this word Rafa we're going to look at today to really show what are exactly demons. So we're going to go through that um, and show you guys. We, we do also have one cross reference I have on the document showing uh, what the book of Enoch even says uh, the demons are. So we're going to, first, what I want to go to is, let's see this little bullet point I have here. Authors of the Old and New Testament never associate demons with fallen angels, like never literally say they're one and the same. Demons are even mentioned, demons are not even mentioned, sorry, I meant to say, are not even mentioned or seem to exist until Genesis 6-4 happens. And we're going to go to that to show why that's a big deal. Um, it's not until after the flood of Noah that they're even mentioned. Um, evil spirits are mentioned. So we're first going to go to Genesis 6-4. And let me just add that to the document here. And anyone that wants a link to it, I'll make this Google Docs link um, available for you guys to share and print out if you want. So let me just change the settings on this. Change to anyone with the link. All right, done. Okay, so we're going to go to Genesis 6-4 and show you guys why this is a big deal, why it doesn't. Um, demons are not even mentioned as the creation for the first six days of creation, even up until after the flood. So Genesis 6-4 says, and you, oh, that's right, the Septuagint's a little a verse off, okay. That the sons of Elohim, and mind you, in actually other versions of the Septuagint, it actually has angels of Elohim. Like the majority of the time in the Hebrew where it's Bene Elohim, it's actually Agilotheos most of the time in the Greek. So it, it, Brenton actually messed up here. He was supposed to put angels of God. Um, but that the angels of Elohim, having seen the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, took to themselves wives of all whom they chose. And I'll just show you proof of that, that it should be angels of God. When you go to the book of Job, it's the same word being used in the Septuagint. And it says, and it came to pass on a day that behold, the angels of Elohim came to stand before you who and the devil came with them. So in the Greek Septuagint, it's angels. They let you know what the sons of Elohim actually are. Um, and another witness for that is Job 2.1 and Job 38 verse 7. They all say angels. So, um, and the Masoretic text in those same verses would say sons of Elohim. So we can kind of get a foundation here. That's what Genesis 6, 4 is talking about. You got two different kinds that were not supposed to mix, basically. And from that, if you go to the next verse in Genesis 6, it says, now the giants were upon the earth in those days. And after that, meaning you had giants in the earth in those days and after that, when the sons of Elohim came into the daughters of mankind, you got two kinds here. They're not both humans. So you got, so that makes a very good distinction right there. So you got two different kinds of mixing, which is against you who is law, you know, you're not supposed to blend two kinds together. So they bore children to them. Those were now the Masoretic will say, men of old it actually says in the septuagint giants of old they were the giants of old men of renown or uh if you have an nlt translation it might say the ancient heroes of old like hercules and you know so on and so forth the nlt translation paraphrases instead of men of renown as heroes of ancient times so in my opinion that makes a lot of sense in my opinion um when you look at the research um, so let me see here. I wonder if I have a version that's kind of similar to that. I have God's word. Uh, what trans, I think the good news Bible actually has it too. Red like that. Let me just see if I can find it. Uh, GNB son of man. Okay. Maybe I don't have it. Maybe I need to get that one. Okay. Anyway. Okay, yeah, the G-O-D's word is like the closest they have to the NLT on the East word here. These were the ch children were famous long ago, you know, so, so it's like famous warriors of ancient times. That's pretty much what it's talking about. So 
again, this is good to understand because now we understand that there's a connection here. You have giants being brought forth that were not part of the original creation, that were part, uh, part of an unset apart union. Um, and now all of a sudden after Genesis six, you have, you know, evil spirits being mentioned, um, in the old Testament. So, and, um, so now we're going to go to the Hebrew word Rapha is the root word for the word Raphaim, which in the old Testament is a tribe of giants. So the root word Rapha, which is translating your Bible as dead or deceased generally is actually more specifically talking about most likely the giants and the Septuagint actually translates it as giants, uh, the Breton's English Septuagint multiple times. So, um, so, and according to the H seven, four, nine, six of the Masoretic Hebrew says ghosts of the dead shades and spirits. So I would say that this seems to allude to that. The Rafa is the spirits of the Raphaim, if that makes any sense. So, um, so we're going to go to a couple of scriptures here. Proverbs 9, 18. Um, the, cu- the public domain version, the 2009 Catholic public domain version, is based upon the Septuagint. Like the, the Latin Vulgate, when St. Jerome started making the Latin Vulgate, he based it upon the Septuagint. So we'll see how it's different here. Instead of dead, you'll see it says giants. So Proverbs 9, 18 says... And he did not know that the giants are there, her companions, and that her companions are in the depths of Sheol. Now, the her is probably referring to the adulterous woman, the strange woman. So there's a connection to the giants from spirits. Uh, By sin is a connection to the giants, to the demons. You see, see where I'm going with this? So you got sin is directly connected to it. So, so again, it's, um, you know, so that talks about her companions go down to Sheol where the giants are. Okay. So where the Rapha are the demons. Okay. So Psalms 88 verse 10 is going to be the next one we go to. So Psalms chapter 88 verse 10, which says, um, let's see here. I think we'll save Enoch for last since, um, since it's an extra biblical book. So Psalms 88 verse 10. Uh, will you perform wonders for the dead or will physicians raise to life and so confess to you? So, okay, the Latin Vulgate has dead, but if we go to the Masoretic text here, there's two words being translated as dead, which is already suspicious here. <laughs> so you got H4191, mooth, which really means dead. You know, someone's that, that's deceased. But then you have H7496, which means Rafa, a ghost, okay? A, a literal ghost, all right? So it's a demonic spirit that it's referring to that the demonic spirits cannot rise in the resurrection. Why would that be? Because they're spirits of giants. That's why. The giants will not raise in the resurrection. That's what Psalms 88.10 is saying. So I think it's important to understand that because the wicked, normally the wicked and the righteous, both rise in the resurrection, one to everlasting life, one to the lake of fire. So, you know, there, so if something's not rising or can't rise in the resurrection, then it can't be a human, right? It can't be something that Yahuwah created. So that's, that's what it's actually talking about. It says, will you work wonders for the dead? Shall physicians raise them up? We know that the de- dead are raised up. This, this is how we know that it's not literally talking about dead people, dead humans, because we know Everyone, according to Daniel, I'll show you guys why this can't be referring to regular humans as the what what dead people they're talking about. Because Daniel 12 verse, let's see here. Verse 2. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to reproach and everlasting shame. The everlasting shame would be referring to the lake of fire. 
So, so again, so obviously if there's no, if they're not part of one of those resurrections of the righteous and the wicked in Psalms 88, 10 is saying that they will not rise. They will not be in the resurrection. That means that they cannot be a human. They have to be something that was not created by Yahuwah that cannot be in a resurrection. So that's why I say that the, even though it's translated as dead, it should be talking about the spirits of the dead giants, um, which you can find in the Masoretic text. Like I said, H7496 is Rafa. So again, it's talking about the spirits of the giants. They cannot be in the resurrection. So anyway, so we're, I'm not going to beat a dead horse there. So we're going to go to the next one there. Um, Proverbs 9, 18, we already went to Psalms 88, verse 10. I'll leave Enoch for last, the extra biblical text for last. Um, okay. So we're going to go now to Breton who translated the Septuagint into English. The majority of the time, this Greek equivalent to the H7496, almost every time in the Breton's English Septuagint is translated as giants not like regular dead. So that's something to keep in mind too, is that probably the translator of the Septuagint understood what Rafa were. Okay. So, um, so let's see here. We're going to go first to Proverbs 2.18. Okay. We're going to go there. Proverbs 2.18. Proverbs 2.18 here. Okay. Come on, guys. Come on. All right. For she has fixed her house near death and guided her wheels near Hades. And Hades, just for anyone that doesn't know, that is a replacement that for some reason the Greeks used for Sheol um, because Hades in the Greek religion was the god of the underworld. So what, so really, it should, it should say Sheol there. It's like one and the same. So it should say, she and guided her wheels near Sheol with the giants. So again, Proverbs 2.18 in the Septuagint has giants instead of just dead, regular dead. Okay. And then if you go into the Masoretic, that word that the Septuagint has for giants is H7496, Rafa. So again, they actually understand that these are the spirits of the dead giants. So, so let me see here. And so now we're going to go to Job 26, verse 5. All right, Job 26, verse 5. We're going to look at the Septuagint version. So we're going to go back to there. Let me just make sure my uh, shared screen is working. Sometimes it messes up. All right, so let's see here. Job 26, verse 5. Shall giants be born from under the water <laughs> and then the inhabitants thereof? Whoa, boy. All right, so this could take us to a whole nother rabbit trail. But uh, this, and this is where some people have the idea that the giants, you know, you know, could have survived in the waters of the flood. I don't exactly ascribe to that opinion. This is just my opinion. I think it's more or less talking about the spirits of the giants. Can the spirits of the giants, can the Rafa be born from under the water? That's what it's talking about. Uh, I don't prescribe to the uh, idea that they survived the flood. Um, their bodies definitely didn't. I'll say that the bodies, the vessels that those spirits were in definitely didn't survive. Um, the dead weight, and see, this is why I don't understand why they put dead here. The ICR puts dead here, but yet you'll see later on in Isaiah with the same exact Hebrew word, they put departed spirits. So it's like, come on, guys, be honest. Uh, be honest with the text here. If you're going to translate departed spirits for the same word, you should translate every time as departed spirits. You know. But anyway, enough of my tangent there. Uh Let's see here. Um, I believe this is Proverbs 21.16 we're going to go to next. 
And uh, did I even list Isaiah 26, 14? I should probably go there right now. Yeah. Let me, uh, let me go there. So yeah, let's go to Isaiah 26, 14. So, and if there's any questions, comments, just feel free to raise your hand. Don't, don't be shy. All right. So the ISR 2009, which uses the Masoretic text here, okay. And Isaiah 26, 14 says, the dead do not live. Okay, that's talking about dead people, right? But then in a different Hebrew word, this is, this is Rapha here. The departed spirits do not rise. Therefore, you have, again, they do not rise. Resurrection, they do not rise. Therefore, you have visited and destroyed them and made all their remembrance to perish. And um, this is the reason why I know some people believe that, you know, I, I've heard crazy theories by other YouTubers like, you know, the giants can, the giants can be redeemed if they repent. No, they can't. They're not, they're not created by the Father. They're not. They're not part of his creation. They're, they're abomination in his eyes. You know, so they can't rise in the resurrection. They can't, you know, they, they can't be redeemed. The giants, they're going to, you know, automatically they're cursed. Automatically because they're part of a unset apart union. They're, they're children of an unset apart union, which most of the mythologies, if you actually look into these mythologies, like the movie Aquaman that came out this year, he even says, I was a product of a love that was not supposed to be. I mean, they're putting it right in plain sight. They're, these hybrids are not supposed to be. And that, that's the point I want to make. You know, and that goes with their spirits too. Their Ruachs are not made from Yahuwah. It's not prescribed from Yahuwah. So it's not a prescri uh, Yahuwah prescribed Ruach or breath of life that he gives all of us. We are the breath of life he makes. So, and that's a whole nother topic about are we our bodies or is the body the vehicle that we are inside? But ultimately, we are our spirit. The spirit is what makes us us. Body is just a vessel. That's all it is. So anyway, I didn't want to go too much into a tangent there, but I thought that was important to address. Um, so Isaiah 14 verse 9, I think is the last one for the Septuagint that says giants, if I'm not mistaken. Or um, let me see here. Uh, Okay, the chief, they call them the chief ones. Oh, okay. Brenton, for some reason, translated this word, it's the same word as the other places that you translate giants. They translate as great ones. I guess you could get the idea that they're referring to the giants, the titans, because, you know, the men of renown, the great ones, you know, the mighty ones of old. I mean, you can technically get that. Um, Sheol from beneath is provoked to meet you. All the great ones that have ruled over the earth have risen up together against you. They that have raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nation. So this, this more sounds like kings of the nations. Yeah, I would take that back. That doesn't even sound like the giants. It just sounds like regular kings. Um, but if you look at, let's see here. Yeah, so if you look at the Masoretic text, though, it has the word Rapha there. So again, it's talking about the spirits of the giants. It says, Sheol from beneath is moved for you to meet at your coming, to stir up the dead. And the word that's being used for dead is Rapha. So it probably should say to stir up the Rapha or the spirits of the Raphaim for you. All the chief ones of the earth, it has raised up from their thrones, all the kings of the nations, which to me actually makes sense. If that's the case that the kings of the earth, the 10 kings are somehow Raphaim in some way, shape or form, that kind of makes sense. Or at least the spirits of the Raphaim are, you know, actually causing them to do things and have one mind to give power to the beast. It would make sense. Yeah, go ahead, brother Jeff. Yeah, is that a, is that a, um, a reference then to the final battle where um, everyone is gathered against him um, to make war. You know, yeah. the, devil's, the devil's released, right? The devil's released um, from the pit and then there's a, 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 a war, right? Like that language feels to me like that's what they're talking about. Yeah, the 10 kings. I kind of got that. Yeah. 
feeling too that when it says the kings of the nations or the kings of the earth, it's talking about those 10 kings that give all their power to the Antichrist, the beast. They, they have one mind, like a hive mind. So what would cause them to have a hive mind, in my opinion, I kind of agree with Gary Wayne and other researchers that the reason they have one mind is because the beast himself is a Raphaim. And they're all, they either have the whole, same type of spirits in them or they're, they're actually physically giants and they all kind of have that same mind. They have a, a hive mind like the bees have a hive and the, the queen bee controls all the other bees, you know, so that, that's kind of how I see it playing out is either it's physically the Raphaim or they got the spirits of the Raphaim that are causing them to give him their power and authority. That's what I think. It, that's what I think it is just because of how the Freemasonic organization works, where they do the rituals for the indwelling and these people of power are actually in indwelt by whatever spirit that they submit to, you know, and that would, those spirits, if they are the disembodies of member, you know, spirits of giants, then we literally have a giant working through a human's body in a position of power to steer the world the way they need it to go. You know, yeah. I don't think that's a, an impossible thing to think, you know, no, not at all. And I think honestly, it would make sense to me because if my theory and a lot of us in our group, we, uh, we kind of agree on who, who I believe the antichrist is. If, if he is the antichrist, it makes sense. It makes perfect sense. He himself began to be a Raphaim in a way when he was alive for the first time on earth. And so it would make sense that they're giving, they would give their power to him because he himself is a chimera and he himself be, became a, a actual giant. So, and uh, so it would make sense. It's like they're, they're kind of giving their power to their own instead of giving it to a human, they're kind of giving it their power and authority to their own. And, you know, so it would kind of make sense to me. And where I get that from that he was a giant is uh, the Septuagint version of Genesis 10 here says he began to be a giant. So he wasn't born a giant. He began to be a giant and something happened. Some either, either he tampered with his genetics, which according to uh, certain church fathers, he found a tablet that, uh, According to uh, the Roman Catholic Church Father, what's his name? Um, Clement, Clement of Alexandria. Recognitions of Clement, you can look this up for yourself. It says that at some point in time, Nimrod found a lost tablet of the Watchers. And so to me, it would make sense if that's the case, if that's 100% true, and we can trust Clement for you know, giving us a historical event, then this makes sense why he began to be a Gibor why he began to be a giant. So he began to be a giant upon the earth. And then it says in verse nine, he was a giant hunter. So he hunted other giants, like physically before Yahuwah Alihim, therefore, and oh, this is another thing too. Um, I think we've mentioned this in other studies. The word before is not supposed to be before. If you look at the Masoretic text here, it says that he, he was a mighty hunter before Yahuwah, okay? It actually... It can mean to face someone or be against someone. Let me see if I can get this on the strongs here. Um, pane, plural, that means a singular of an unused noun, is in great ver variety of applications as a preposition. Before, against is one of its definitions. So to me, it would make more sense that he's against the father. If he just turned himself into a giant, okay, he, he, is, he is tampering with his genetics. He, he's, he's actually doing something he's not supposed to do. You know, Yahuwah makes everything according to its own kind. And he's turning himself into another kind or making himself into a hybrid. So I doubt he was for Yahuwah at that point. Um, you know, Yahuwah probably used him for his purpose to kill the other giants. He could have still used him. But as far as being righteous, he was probably against Yahuwah. Um, and the, um, I think the Targum of the verses actually says, he was a mighty rebel against Yahuwah in Mighty and Rebellion. Yeah, go ahead, Jeff. Josephus um, also has a reference to them building the tower to escape a destruction of a, a, another flood. Yeah. And, and making war, obviously, go, yeah. being able to go into heaven and make war. So, I mean, that seems pretty against, yeah. Yeah, that and that, yeah, Josephus mentions that, that that was the purpose for the Tower of Babel. Yeah, was to escape another flood and to actually kill you who in heaven, which Jasher talks about. 
says that they wanted to set up their own idols in, in the, in the highest heaven where Yahuwah's throne is and pretty much take out Yahuwah, take out Yahusha and the angels. They wanted to make war. So that's why I say that Isaiah 14, 12 is, I don't believe it's only talking about Satan here. I believe this could be, it could be him and Nimrod together. It could be because we see this phrase, I will this, I will that in the book of Jasher, referring to those that built the Tower of Babel when they were trying to get up into heaven. And so I just, I find it interesting that it says in Isaiah 14, 13, I will go up into heaven. I will set up my throne above the stars of heaven. I will sit on the lofty mount on the sides towards the north. Satan could have been using Nimrod to accomplish this. He could have been, all right, you know what? Build this tower. Come on, build this tower so you can get up there and war against Yahuwah. So I, so, you know, so I can win my war. He could have been using Nimrod as a little pawn in his war against Yahuwah to try to defeat Yahuwah and, and the angels. And, you know, once Yahuwah thwarted that plan, he had to rethink his strategy, how to make war in heaven. It was probably his first attempt, in my opinion. So I think Isaiah 14, I don't have proof of it, but just the fact that this chapter also talks about the king of Babylon, it starts out by talking about Israel's remnant taunts Babylon. So, and it talks about the king of Babylon, like says, uh, let me see here if I can find it. Yahuwah shall give you rest from your sorrow and vexation. You shall take up this lamentation against, yep, right here, verse four, the king of Babylon. How has the extortioner ceased and taskmaster ceased? Now we know that as far as I know from history, Nebuchadnezzar never tried to make a tower of Babel. So as, as far as I know, this, to me, it sounds like Nimrod's the king of Babylon it's referring to because I've never, I don't know, uh, unless someone, anyone listening, viewing on Facebook Live, if you can give me a resource that would contradict what I'm saying, I'll look into it. But I, I haven't seen any other king of Babylon try to do this other than Nimrod. So that's why I believe it's Satan and Nimrod doing this at the same time. So, but anyway, I don't want to go too much on a tangent. Um, but so now we're up to Jude chapter one, verse six and second Peter chapter two, verse four. And so this, I'm using these two scriptures to show you angels don't need to possess a body. They, they have their own body. They really don't need to go into our human bodies and possess us. There's no purpose for that. They already have their own bodies. They have, um, celestial bodies and sometimes they take on terrestrial bodies as we're going to see in Jude 1, 6. Sometimes they can transform and kind of think of it as it's the reverse of the resurrection. What the watchers did is actually the reverse of what Yahusha, when he returns, what he's going to do for us. We're, we're getting rid of these terrestrial bodies, these terrestrial Okaterions, you could say, and we're getting a new Okaterion that's from heaven. So, so the watchers did the reverse. And we're going to see uh, in Jude 1, 6, it alludes to that with the word Okaterion. Uh, so I think I'm going to be reading the Apostolic Bible Polyglot here because they're the only one that translates this Greek word correctly. Uh, okay, Let's see here. All right. Also, angels not keeping their own sovereignty, referring to heaven. So that Greek word is referring to up there in heaven but leaving their own dwelling place. So that's the word Okaterion there. And I'll show you in the Greek if we go to the Strong's here. So habitation more correctly should be translated as um, dwelling place. Okaterion. Okay. A habitation house. And if you go to the Thayers, it says a dwelling place, habitation of the body as a dwelling place for the spirit. So Paul uses this in one other place. It's used by Paul. I think this, there's only like two or three occurrences of this in the new Testament. The only other place is when it's referring to us, our bodies are a dwelling place for the set apart spirit. So obviously it's referring to a body. So, so it's saying that the angels left their body, took another body. They left their, their principality, which is in heaven came down to earth. So as you see here, they don't need to possess anyone. They can have their own terrestrial body if they really want. So now we're going to go to 2 Peter 2, 4, which I believe also gives credence to this idea. They don't need to possess anyone. Okay, it says, for if Yahuwah, or Elohim, if you prefer, 
did not spare the angels when they sinned, but rather confined them to Tartarus. So Tartarus, according to Plato, the Greek philosopher, Tartarus is a place that is as far under the ground as heaven is above the firmament, pretty much. So it's a deep, 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 deep pit. Pretty much is like probably a compartment in the bottomless pit, if I was to guess. Um, and Enoch is the only book that talks about Tartarus and what, it, you know, what's going on down there. Um, and another thing to note, which I find kind of interesting, if you look in Greek mythology, they twist the narrative of this verse. They say that Poseidon and Zeus and the so-called gods chain their enemies to Tartarus. So they try to put them in Yahuwah's place and in Yahusha's place. So they try to do a little bit of replacement theology with this story. So, but this story is like, you can find multiple witnesses that this is real, that they're chained in Tartarus in different mythologies. Um, so they're chained. And obviously if they're chained, they have their own body. And if they're chained, they can't go anywhere. So how, how are they going to possess anyone if they're chained? So we know that there's demonic possession going on right now. These guys are chained or have been chained for a very long time. And so they can't be demons because demons are still possessing people. They're down there. And just like we saw in the book of Jude, they have their own bodies. They don't, they don't need to possess anyone. So, um, so let's see here. Now we're up to second Corinthians eleven fourteen, And after this, I'll go to the book of Enoch and show you verbatim what they say demons are and how this goes along with what we've seen in the canon here. Um, 2 Corinthians eleven fourteen. 14. Um, we're going to go to that, show how Satan to this day can still transform back into his original body. He can, he can still go back into his, uh, his original celestial body, you could say. And it says here, and no wonder for Satan himself transforms into an angel of light. And this is not paraphrasing. This is not allegorical. If you look at the Greek word here, change appearance, okay, G3345, meta, metaskamatizo, so meta, like metamorphosis, it's probably a related word there, uh, to, to change the figure of, to transform, you know, transformers more than meets the eye, yeah, that's probably where they got that idea from, transformers, yeah. So uh, I usually tell people Transformers, in my opinion, is them like repackaging the fallen angels. That's all that is. And so it's them transforming into different shapes. And, you know, um, Brother Jeff and Sisters of Zakiah were mentioning to me off, off the record that there's these stories all over that you got these so-called ascended masters that could transform into different forms. And, you know, the, the natives would know them as like the Aryan race, you know, sometimes they're called like the, the Pleiadians or the, the blonde hair, blue eyed, really shiny people, like pale, pale people. And uh, so, uh, and I don't have it on this document, but in the book of Enoch, Noah's parents were extremely worried when they saw he was an albino. Because according to them, that's what the watchers looked like when they took on human flesh. They looked paler than me, though. We're talking about like white, white. We're talking about like albino. So I know there's a lot of people that I want to twist that in the BHI movement, but no, it's just they were worried because he was albino. He was very pale white, like paler than most Europeans. So, you know, that's why they were worried. They were like, oh, you know, he probably was wondering, you know, what happened to my, you know, did my wife cheat on me or something? You know, I've kind of theorized like why Noah's dad was so worried. He was like, you know, what's going on here? So, but anyway, let's go. I think we got one reference left here. We got Enoch 15 verse eight, and I have it on the tab here. So this is the book of Enoch. This is an extra biblical book that gives like, we've already went through like four or five different witnesses in the canon that prove what Rafa is, what these Rafa, what these ghosts are. So I'm just using this as a last witness, a last one extra biblical witness to show you this is the right interpretation of what demons are. Um, now the giants, Enoch chapter 15, verse eight, who have been born of spirit and flesh because they're part celestial, part terrestrial, celestial, part angel, part, part human. That's why Greek mythology, they're called demigods. 
Okay, that, that's where that comes from, the demigod thing. Okay, part human, part celestial. Who have been born of spirit and of flesh shall be called upon the earth evil spirits, and on earth shall be their habitation. Evil spirits shall proceed from their flesh, meaning from the bodies of the giants, because they were created from above, and from the set-apart watchers was their beginning and primor, primary foundation or origin. Evil spirits shall they be upon the earth, the spirits of the wicked shall they be called. <laughs> I kind of like that, yeah, because they're dwelling in wicked, pe wicked people. It's directly uh, correlated to sin. Sin opens a door for demonic spirits to enter your body. Like if you're, if you're not dealing with a specific sin and you keep letting it go on, go on, go on, then you leave an open door for a demonic spirit to enter your body or just for it to afflict you. And, you know, um, the habitation of the spirits of heaven shall be in heaven, but upon the earth shall be the habitation of terrestrial spirits who are born on earth. So this explains here why they can't go up to heaven and they can't go into, they really can't go into the natural part of Sheol. They have to be in a separate portion. Like their bodies, yeah, are, you know, down in the pit or whatever, but they're roaming on the earth. They have nowhere to go. So this is where we get the idea in our modern culture, especially like Halloween with ghosts and stuff like that. They got unfinished business, you know, that that's, they try to paint it as something good pretty much. So, um, so I've, that's pretty much all I had. I'm going to see if my brothers and sisters have anything to add, or maybe I forgot something. Um, so, um, just anyone that wants to have a question or add any comments? No. Going once, twice. All righty. Okay. Thank you for joining us today. I, I pray that this would help you understand the context of what demons are and help you separate between demons and fallen angels. Um, if you want any further information on it, you can feel free to reach out to our fellowship group. Um, and uh, we might be recording again later on doing a, a separate uh, type of topic study. So if not, um, all to, all to our brothers and sisters out there who are in Yahoo and Yahusha. Have a great rest of your Sabbath, um, and we'll see you soon. Shalom.